recording? All right, cool. So the only thing we're going to do today is to go over exam one from spring 2024, which is just the previous semester. Um, everything is being recorded. The voice, of, the voice looks good. And I have the whole thing prepared in Joplin. So at the end of today's class, you know, I can you know, capture the markdown and also the PDF of the document. So if you want to do some editing on your own, you know, add your own notes and whatnot, the markdown version is better. But if you just want to be able to print it out, then the PDF version is just as good. All right. So you can focus on the right-hand side as usual, you know, because I'll be typing on the left-hand side. All right. So you know, I probably have mentioned this already, but I will mention it again. Um, you are allowed to bring you know, any amount of material that is on paper. And I'm not talking about e-paper, I'm talking about actual paper paper made out of dead trees. Okay. <clears throat> um, you can have it printed, you can also have it handwritten, you know, or a mix of the two, you know, doesn't matter. Um, all right. Do not share or discuss any part of this exam, you know, in class or otherwise on the day of the exam. You know, just because you know some people may be taking the exam a little earlier or later. Your grade, the grading is based on explanation, especially on the questions where I ask for explanation. Not every question is you know uh, need full detailed explanation. Some basically have built-in explanation portions to it. Uh, sufficient explanation means your answer has to make connections between the definitions that we talk about in class and also the problem that you see, you know, the questions that you see in the exam. In a multi-part question, an incorrect answer to an earlier part of the question may or may not lead to partial credit for later parts, okay? So do we have any questions about all of this stuff here, everything that I have just mentioned? Okay, looks like there are no questions. I'm gonna delete this whole thing, you know, because it's incorrect, okay, there we go. All right, so uh, in the question, in the exam from last semester, questions one to four have the same format, okay? Even though the answers are different, they test you on different things, okay? But they have the same kind of format. So we're gonna read the question. You are given that A as a set has C, K, J, R as elements, and B as a set has M, D, Q, R as elements. You're also given that F zero as a set is um, has CB as a two tuple, RQ as a two tuple, KM as a two tuple, and then CQ also as a two tuple. So just out of this part, this portion here, do we have any questions about the use of notations, like the set notation, you know, tuples, that sort of thing? Do we have any questions about that? Nope. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so the first. Uh, actual question for 5%, which is not a whole lot of points because it is pretty easy to answer, is whether um, F0 is a function with A as a domain and B as a codomain. So we'll check it out, okay? So we want to look at A has C, K, J, R in it. So C, K, up, oh, we don't have J and R. So A is a function, or F0 being a function to map from A to B is false. So you can say false, you can also say no in this case. So both are correct answers. Um, all right, so moving on. What is the value of, <clears throat> for all X in A, there exists a Y in B, such that xy as a two tuple is an element of f0. If the answer is false, then specify a value for x, which is this variable here, that makes the underlined statement false. This is the underlined statement here. Okay, so let me go to the answer portion and I will note the answer. There we go. All right, so first of all, is the quantified expression true or false? How do we evaluate that? Okay, it's a double loop, okay? The outer loop is the for all, which means everything that is nested to be true, 
and the inner loop is a there exists, which means you know, we need at least one thing that is nested that is true. So now we go through every element of A, okay? We look at C, K, J, and R, and then ask, <clears throat> can I find something in B so that F0 is mapping the element of A, of A to the element of B? The answer is, well, probably not, because we already know that A is not a function, and the, re and the reason why we know A, I mean F0, we know F0 is not a function because <clears throat> we have C, K, Where's J here? J is not there, right? So that means that J as an element of A is not mapped to anything in B in any of the two tuples of F0. So that means to answer this question, it's a two part. The first answer is, the first part of the answer is false. And then the second part is you know, what value of X will make the entire um, quantified expression false. And in this case, you know, we just have to say, okay, if x is j, then you know, the quantified expression, you know, this whole this portion, which is the underlying portion, is going to be false. So is that okay? Does everybody understand you know, why, you know, what, the, what the answer is and why you know, x being j is at least one of the answers? So since we're here, we might as well you know, take a look at, is there another possible answer? So we have c, we have k, J is missing, R is here. Now, do you think you know, X being C is a potential answer? It is not a potential answer because C is not even an element of A, so X being C is not gonna be considered a correct answer. So the only answer in this case is when X equals to J. I'm gonna pause and see if there are any questions about this. Could you repeat the last statement, what you said about x equals c? So x being c is not an answer. In other words, when x equals to c, this portion, I mean, x being, x cannot even be c, because x has to be an element of a. An element of a, oh, it does have c. Okay, okay, I take it back. <laughs> okay, so, because it appeared twice. So c is okay, actually, because it maps to two things, which is fine, because we just need a there exists. Okay, so I take it back, I was wrong. Okay. <clears throat> All right, moving on to part three. Uh, what is the value of there exists X in A, there exists Y, Z in B, such that Y does not equal to Z, and X, Y is an element of F0, and X and Z is also an element of F0. In other words, it's really asking is at least is there at least one element in A that maps to two different things in B? That's basically what it's asking. Okay. First question: Do we know how to read this entire quantified expression? Is that okay? All right. So the answer is okay. So let me go to the correct part here. So the answer is true, okay, meaning the um, quantified expression returns a value of true. So if it returns a true, that means, ah, okay, I should be able to find the values of A, Y, X, excuse me, uh, excuse me, X, Y, and Z, so that the underlying portion is true, okay, because it, they're all existentially quantified. So in this case, we can make, we already know the answer because I just mentioned something like that earlier. X has to be C in this case, and then Y, okay, I have to look it up to see how C is mapped, B and Q. Okay, so B and Q are the Y and Z. Here. There we go. So Y is a B, and then Z is a, I cannot remember, Q. Q. Yep, Q, Q it is. There we go. And 
suppose that. So that is the solution. Any questions about number three? Yes. Yep. So you can you can make y equal to q and z equal to b. That would be considered just as correct as an answer. All right. Very good. Um, I'm going to kind of zoom out a little bit because otherwise it's just harder for me to read both the original part of the question and your answer. There we go. So this is good. Okay. Now I get to see everything. All right. So question number four or part four of the question is asking you to define f of 1. So I want to define f of 1 so that it equals to f0 minus some e0 in a set um, in union with b1. So what that means is I'm taking one of the elements out, or as an example, it doesn't have to be that way because if e0 is not even el an element of f0 to begin with, then it's not taking out anything. But in this context, it is. So I need to find E0 and E1 such that all of the following criteria are met. So F0 is already determined, OK? So that's part of the question. So let's take a look at all the criteria all the criteria first, and then we'll try to figure out you know, what E0 and E1 should be. <clears throat> all right, 4.1 okay, is asking, find element E0 that is an element of the Cartesian product between A and B, so that there exists an X in A, that exists a Y, Z in B, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I think we, I hope you guys will remember that we just saw this earlier, which is this thing here. So, oh, and X, Y is in F0 minus E0, and x z is x y is in this set x z is also in the same set so we want that to be false okay we want this quantified expression to be false so what e0 should i be should i use here Well, in the earlier part here is helping you to answer that question, okay? So let me put it in first, and then we'll, I'll explain why that is an answer. So let me put the cursor here, and then we'll type it. So we want E0 to be, let's see, we want to subtract that one thing. So there are two choices, okay? So I'll present you both choices here, and then you tell me which one is the correct one, or if both of them are actually correct as well. So let me just scroll up. It's harder for me to kind of track where the answer is now. Okay. So E0 can be the two tuple of CB. Oh, there we go or E0 can be the two tuple of CQ. All right. So can we make the determination of which one? Okay, so first of all, we'll plug in E0, you know, as CB into this whole thing, and see whether you know, that is meeting all the requirements. First of all, is E0 as CB, is it an element of the Cartesian product between A and B? In other words, I'm asking, is C coming from A? Yep. Is B coming from B? Yes. Okay. So it has met this requirement already, so this is okay. So now we look at the second requirement. We want this entire quantified expression to be false. Okay. So now we are asking, if we consider F0, but without CB, okay, so you take out CB in F0, would this statement be false? So um, can I find at least one thing in A? Um, can I find Y, Z in B? Y and Z being different? And X, A, X, Y is in you know, the smaller set, and X, Z is also in the smaller set. The answer is no, okay? Because we cannot find one thing in A 
that is mapped to two things in D anymore once we have taken out um, CB. But the same can be said about CQ, because if I take out CQ, then it is still the same thing. Is that okay? Because you know, this is specifically asking for, am I mapping one thing in A to two things in B? So both of these are seem to be correct answers at this point. So we then look at the second portion. Can I find another element E1, which is also in the Cartesian product between A and B, so that for all X in A, there exists Y in B, so that you know, X, Y are mapped X is mapping to Y. I don't care about the number of times it's mapped. I only want to know um, whether it's mapped or not. And in this case, I'm, union, I'm using a union of F0 and the set that contains E1. So that means I'm just adding E1 to the original set without removing anything yet. Okay, so we'll go ahead and look at the original thing because I want to show the original F0, A, and B. And then we'll try to answer that question. Okay, so the answer goes right here. All right, so let's try to figure out you know, what we can take out, okay, or what we can add so that you know it is true. So we are trying to figure out what E1 can be. We already know it's a two tuple, so I can you know, do the formatting first. So the question is, what was missing earlier? J. That's right, so J is missing earlier, and I don't really need to know, you know where J needs to map to, because it just says, you know, I just need to map J to one of the things in D. So I actually got a few options here. I can map it to M, okay. Um, okay, I'm just gonna use the, or, okay, I'm just gonna use, um, I cannot use or because it's a word. Um, it can also be J, B. It can also be J Q. It can also be J R. Okay, so right now I cannot distinguish which one of the four is the correct answer, or maybe you know any one of these is a correct answer because I have to look at the other requirement as well. All right. So having said all this, do we have any questions at this point? The notation that you see here is simply saying that J M J B J Q J R. Each one is a possible answer at this point. I cannot eliminate any one of these choices yet because they all meet the requirement that we need. Yeah. So for question four, we're gonna go through all of these steps and come up with the one answer for for each um, one of the three. You, if you can, if you can just eyeball the whole thing, you can just you know give me the answer. You know that's fine too. So. For example, if we were to just for four part two, just put like J M, mm -hmm. that would be correct. If would you if it works out, okay. yeah, because we have two more criteria that we have not evaluated yet. Yep. So because we don't know the other two criteria, you would want us to uh, for number question number two. Right? No. So as far as grading is concerned, you know you don't have to show me the steps. You just have to get to the final answer. But in order to get to the final answer, I think it's better to track the possible answers first and then finish all the criteria to, in order to make sure that, oh, okay, you know, this is gonna work, this is gonna work. So I'm only showing you the process of how to do this, but not necessarily you know, the, the final form of the answer. Okay, so going to 4.3, okay? So 4.3 is asking um, for all D, W, X, Y in F1. So this time, you know, I'm using F1 as defined here because by the time we know what is E0 and what is E1, we can define the actual F1. So now I'm applying this criteria, criterion to F1. So we want F1 to make this universally quantified expression false, okay? So the next question is, okay, so what does it, what does it say? So we will focus on just the quantified expression and try to figure out what does it what does it mean. So I'm taking two things or two elements from F1, and both of these are two tuples. I want to make sure that you know, E and X are different. If that is different, it implies W and Y are different. 
and I want to make sure that no matter what I choose, which two, two, which two, two tuples I choose on F1, this remains to be true. So does that remind you of some of the properties of a function, assuming F1 is a function? Injection, that's right. Because what this is saying is if, if B and X are different, they have to map to two different things. So it's the same thing as saying that F1 has to be injected. Okay, all right. So I want that to be false, okay? In, in, in other words, I don't want an injective function. I don't want an injection. Specify BW as an element of F1 and XY as an element of F1 that makes the underlying statement false. And I need to know what is what you have chosen as BW and what you have chosen as XY, okay? So at this point, you have to go back and go like, okay, so now that we know that F1, you know, after all the modification, after removing one thing and adding one more thing, we want it to be a, an injection, okay? All right, so how do you, what are we gonna do? Because we want it to not be an injection. Hmm? We want it to not be an injection. We, we want it to not be an injection. Might be one little problem, but we'll, we'll get to it when we get to it. All right. So the original A, or the, the original F zero, the original F zero um, has CB, and we are t we have to take out one of the CB or the CQ, um, and we are adding one more. Thing. We are adding either JM, JB, JQ, or JR. So that means you know, we just have to make sure that you know, we end up with two things mapping to the same thing in the end. So that means we can add JQ and remove CB. That's one solution. So I'm going to go back to the earlier part and remove the one that we do not want to use as a, as a solution. So we are taking out this one. Okay. So we are only removing CB and we are adding JQ. So over here, I'm eliminating the other ones. Now this may not be the only unique solution, but it is a solution. So now I have you know, just you know, fixed you know, what E0 is and what E1 is. So that means you know, at this point, I know what F1 is going to look like, which I think might be a problem because I think I have, uh, it may not even be a function at this point because of the extra one thing that, that's in it. So we'll see, we'll take a look. So that means at this point, F1, as a set would have the following items. Okay, let me scroll back up. Okay, the CB is out because I you know, just specified here, you know, take out CB. So, I think next time I'm just gonna use my tablet to handwrite the answer. Um, all right, so CB is out, but we are putting in, so RQ is still here, RQ is here, KM is still here, and then CQ is here, and then there's one more thing because we are adding back JQ, okay, so JQ also can be here. All right, so I'm taking a look at this. C, C, K, J, R. Okay, it is a function and it is not injected. Okay, so we are focusing on this one here. F1, as it is defined here, is a function, but it's not injected. All right, so let me just pause, okay? Are we convinced? 
this particular F1, as it is defined here, with A and B defined earlier, one, it is a function. One of these is a function. Okay, so let's double check. C maps to one and only one thing. Okay, that's good. K maps to one and only one thing in B. Okay, that's now also required. J maps to one and only one thing in B. And then R maps to one and only one thing in B. It satisfies all the requirements to be a function. So once it's a function, we can now evaluate whether it is an injection. We don't want it to be injection, okay? So because we can see that, oh, look at this. R, C, and J are all mapping to the same thing in the codomain. So that means it is definitely not an injection. So it has met all the requirements so far, but that's only three out of four. So we, we'll take a look at the fourth one. Okay, so this is the last one. We want that to be true. Okay, so let's take a look at what this is trying to say. So there exists one element in B, which is our codomain, such that it is not the case that there's at least one thing in A, which is our domain, that is mapping to that thing in the codomain in the new function that we have just created. In other words, I want to find something in the codomain that is not mapped. Is that okay? So does the function that I have just defined satisfy that requirement? So we have to find out what is in B first, okay? So that's why it's important to see what is in B. The question is, is something mapping to M? Yep, okay. Is something mapping to B? Nope. Okay, we're good. Because requirement number four is trying to say, okay, is at least one thing in the codomain not mapped to? And if there is, give me an example of such a thing. So in this case, we can now say that x is b. b in the codomain is not mapped to. So that's the answer for this one. And then for the earlier one, um, I forgot to answer that one. So for the early one between um, b, w, and x, y, so we'll go ahead and answer that one. It's uh, anything that maps to RQ, okay? Two things that map to RQ. So RQ is one, and then um, the other one is CQ. Okay. All right, so let's double check and make sure that answer is okay. So we are talking about part three at this point. So we want this to be false and I want to give use an example to where this is false. In order for the implication to be false, the left hand side has to be true, which means if B and X have to be different, okay, R as B, C as X, they're different. So we have satisfied the requirement on the left hand side of the implication, but we want the right hand side to be false. The right hand side, you know, is specifying W does not equal to Y, but we want it to be false, which means W and Y need to be exactly the same. So Q as W, Q as Y, they are the same. So now we have satisfied the requirement of the left hand side being true, the right hand side of the implication being false. So this is one way to satisfy that requirement. Obviously, it is not the only way, because you can just kind of switch the variables around a little bit and in fact we have three things from a they're all mapping to q so you got lots of choices of you know how to answer this part of the question are we still doing okay so far okay okay so let me finish this entire thing and then we'll kind of go back and see if i can address you know, any questions and possibly make a suggestion of how to study for this test all right, <clears throat> so now we are moving on to this question here. It's only asking about the intersection between F0 and F1. So that's probably one of the easiest portion to answer. Oh, okay, I just did something stupid. Um, right there, okay. And it's harder for me to answer this here because um, I have to scroll around to see what is in the original F0. So 
So if you look at the intersection between F0, which is defined here, and F1, which is defined here, RQ, KM, CQ are the, are the three elements that are common. So now I can go back to that portion and actually write down the answer here. Okay, so we have RQ, KM, K comma M, and C comma Q as the common elements between K between F zero and F one. Is that okay so far? Okay. Did anyone try to answer all of these questions prior to today's class? Okay. Because that would help. That would definitely have helped. All right, so the last part, which is number six, um, F1, you, F1 should be a function now. Mapping from A, which is our domain, to B, which is our codomain, should be true. As to the following parts, is F1 injective? Nope. And is F1 surjective? Also that. There we go. <clears throat> All right. So now that we have answered the entire question number one, okay, you are going like, okay, you know, this is really boring because I got this all figured out, you know, already. Good, congratulations. <laughs> because you know, if you have all the time in the world, okay, which you did have, okay, it's because I gave you this exam how many days ago? At least five, maybe seven. So if you use some of that time to actually answer the questions, you know, and actually try to use your time to try to parse the quantified expression, that we, that's studying already, okay? That really is studying for this class already. And then when you try to get to this, you know, these questions and go answer these questions, that's also studying, okay? And that's why, you know, I recommended people to kind of work, start to work on this and don't wait until I talk about it in the class. Okay, so that's one way to prepare, okay? So let's just say that some people did not do that, okay? This is the first time they opened up you know, this past exam, okay? So now the question is, okay, now what do I do, okay? How do I study for the exam? One thing is, one thing you may not want to do is to overstudy the solution of this particular test, okay? Why do you think I, gave, I give you guys that warning? Yep, because your test is going to be different, okay? Overdoing this one, you know, we're basically, okay, this is why we have that thinking box, okay? You guys have all have heard of, um, you know, thinking out of the box, right? So the first, the question is, who put the box in our head to begin with? We, us, okay? We put that box in because we over-practice. Because when we over-practice, then we only consider, oh, there's only one way to ask a question about a certain concept, and there's only one way to answer that question, okay? So over-practicing is actually what put that box on our head to begin with. So the way to look at this is to look at all the quantified expression, and instead of looking at a quantified expression like this thing here, and go like, okay, I don't know what it is, okay? Instead of just doing that, spend the time to try to understand what it means, okay? I have given you some tools to do this because you know we basically look at this as loops, right? Nested loops. This one is basically a triple loop, okay? It is a loop in a loop in a loop. The outermost loop is something that will choose a particular element from A. The middle loop is something that will choose an element Y from B and then the innermost loop is a loop that would choose a certain element Z from also B. And in the innermost portion of the entire loop, the triple loop, is this statement that we have to evaluate. That statement depends, I mean, as ugly as it seems, okay? It is actually not that complicated because you know, they are both asking, basically they're asking, do we have this particular element in this set here. This is the same set as F0, except whatever we choose as E0, we just take it out 
of that set. And the same thing over here. So is that okay so far? Yep. I don't get the taking the part out twice. Twice? Like Mm -hmm. And then and x y is an element of x zero minus u zero. Uh huh. Can you go over that part for me? Okay, sure. Um, I understand everything that's like the three giant loops, and then y yep. is not equal to e. Yep. And then so the rest of that is equal. Okay, so if you look at this expression, and then you look at this expression, you know one looks a lot uglier than the other one, but the only difference really is I'm using f zero here. And I'm using F0 minus the set that contains E0 here. That's the only difference. So both of these are really asking, um, is one thing in A, which is our, our you know, proposed domain, mapping to two different things in the code domain? That's basically what, what it's asking. The difference is, this is referring to the original F0 as it was defined in the question. And this is applying to kind of F0, but with E0 removed from it. But it's still asking, are we mapping one thing to two different things? I get it. All right. So after you take E0 out of this whole thing, it should not be mapping the one thing, one thing to two different things anymore. So that's basically what, how we choose you know, what element to remove from the set. So if we take CB out, there is no longer two things mapping yep. to one thing. Yep. So it's false, and that's what we want. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because if you want to make this false, okay, that's the part of the constraints. So the basically whole constraints of how we choose e zero and e one, because you know in the end we want to make sure that we don't we are not mapping one element from a to two different elements in the code domain in, in b, which is what number one is talking about, but we also want to um, make sure that criterion number two is true, which means we don't want to miss anything. So we want to make sure that everything in A maps to at least one thing in B. So that's what E1 is for, is to kind of patch that hole of going like, oh, okay, in the original F0, we are not mapping every element in A to at least one thing in B, and we're not, we not patching it so that it does. Is that okay? All right. So the the crux of doing this is being able to read the quantified expression. Okay. So that is the key to you know getting this test done as it is. It is the key is really reading the quantified expression and relating those quantified expressions to the concepts that we have learned already, which is injection, surjection, and bijection. Hmm? You can probably not easily. <laughs> I think there are ways to draw this. Okay, so if, if you want to, I don't have the I don't have my tablet you know activated yet, so I can use the whiteboard to do it. Okay, any objection if I turn off one of the screens and use the whiteboard behind it? Okay, all right, so let's do that. I'm trying to pick up the one in the middle. <clears throat> and I know the problem of this table blocking the view of a bunch of people on this side, so I'm going to try to lower that as much as possible. Okay, so a potential graphical way to look at this, okay, I still have to look at this because I cannot remember the original mapping. So if you think about this being A and this being B, and A has... C, uh, A, C, K, C, K, J, R, C, K, J, R, and then B has M, B, Q, R, M, B, Q, R. Now, obviously, this portion is not recorded. The voice is still recorded, but you know, I, I'm not recording the uh, whiteboard content. So yep. Quick questions: Are R's the is the R and A and the R and B different R's? It doesn't matter. Because they're in different sets, you know, to begin with, so it doesn't matter whether they are really the same or not. 
you can you can think of them as being the same thing because the value of r is the value of r. So if you are to compare this element with this element, the equality will be true. So, okay. So now we draw the lines of the actual mapping, which is C to here. Okay, so let's draw this line. And then we have <coughs> R to Q. So R to Q. And then we have K to M. And then finally we have um, C to Q. So D to Q. Okay, there we go. Are we good so far? All right, so this is the visual way of looking at the mapping. The, the, okay, so we'll address each one. So question number one, is this a function? It is not a function for two reasons, okay? One, if you look at C, it maps to two different things in the codomain. If you, if you look at J, it doesn't map to anything. So both of those are reasons why F0 the current mapping is not a function. So that's why, you know, uh, for part number one, the answer is no. For part two, yes? So can it still be a function and map one element to the other element? <laughs> <laughs> but this is good, okay? This is why I think you guys should try to ask questions as much as possible, because a lot of times, okay, by the time you ask the question, you already have the answer. And those are the best questions. Okay, you know, some people, some professors may think of those as the stupid questions because you just answer your own, your own question by asking the question itself. But I think those are the smartest questions because those are the questions where you are exercising you know, the knowledge, you're exercising reasoning because in order to formulate the question, your mind has to work in a different way than just thinking about something because you have to verbalize. And in that process, a lot of times, you, it will just make all the connections that you were originally looking for. By verbalizing, you are making all those connections, and as a result, by the time you finish asking the question, and sometimes even before you finish asking the entire question, it's like, never mind. Those are the best questions. <clears throat> all right, so getting to part two, okay? So part two is asking, you know, what is the value of, for every x in A, um, there's something in D so that that X in A is mapping to that Y in D. So the answer is no, it is false because J is in A and it's not mapping to anything in D. Okay, so that's why, you know, for question number two, X equals to J is the correct answer because it is not mapping to anything in D. Is that okay? So looking at a graphical representation, you know, this is the reason why number two has is false and x equals to j. Number three, yep. That I think is true in the sense that what I was saying is the reason that what you're saying is you're just saying that all the elements are in, but I'm, mm -hmm. at least one element of B needs to Okay. It's asking. Is there a loop that's what I, I, I no, it, say there's only there are only two loops for question number two. There's only it's a double loop. Okay, it's so it's a right. nested loop, but there are only two, because it's asking. The question is: Is it true or false that everything in A, for everything in A, there is something in D, so that that one thing in A and that one thing in D, are mapped by F zero. That's what it's asking. So the way you answer the question is you look at everything in A and you ask the question, is C mapping to, you know, at least, is there one thing in D that C is mapping to? So like, oh yeah, there are two in fact. But it's okay to be two because for this particular question, I just want to know is there at least one, okay? Two is at least one, we're good. What about K? Yep, K to KM is K maps to M because of F0, okay, we're good. J, uh-uh, not so good, because J is not mapped to anything in D according to F0, and that's why you know, the quantified expression is false, because I need every element in A to map to at least one thing in D, and J does not map to anything. But that answer could be true if J was 100% regardless of everything in A. That is correct. 
but the way f of zero is set up is that j does not, there's nothing corresponding to j according to f of zero. Okay, so go to, yeah. Oh, okay, I thought there was a hand. So going to number three, what is the value of you know, the triple loop, this and the other triple loop? Because you know, um, there exists y, right here. So this is a shorthand of a double loop because you know, the way we choose y and the way we choose z are independent. So basically we are saying, okay, can we choose something um, in d for y and can we choose something in d for z? So that's a double loop all by itself. Is that okay? No? Okay. So there exists y, z, in d, blah, blah, blah. It's really the same thing. It's a shorthand of there exists y in d, and there exists z, z in d, such that blah, blah, blah. This is the same thing. Is that okay? So this is a shorthand of that. Instead of you know, mentioning there exists twice, I'm just you know, compacting you know, those two there exists or the existential quantifiers onto the one onto one single term. Is that okay? So that's why this is basically a double loop because that's a double loop. All right. So for number three, you know that's why you know x equal to c b. Y equals to B and Z equals to Q is a is an answer because we can see how C maps to D and Q. Are we doing okay so far with this? <clears throat> yes. Okay. So, uh, and then for number four. Part one of number four is asking you, can we take something out of x f zero so that we don't have one thing from A mapping to two things in D? So you, you basically ask the question, who was mapping to two different things in D to begin with? You go like, oh, C. So let's take out one of these two, okay? So we are looking at either this one or this one. Okay, so we have to take out one of those two. Um, and then for number two, okay, you know, I'm moving the mouse pointer here. For this one, we are asking uh, something in F0 was missing, okay? In other words, one thing in A is not mapping to anything in B. Let's fix that. That's what part two of four is trying to fix. So you look at A and go like, oh yeah, J, you're the one who's not mapping to someone. Let's map you to someone. But who should I map to, okay? Uh, J can potentially map to M, D, Q, or R in D, okay? So all of those are valid answers if I only want to look at parts one and two of four, okay? But then we have the extra requirements you know, of three and four of part four. Part three of four <laughs> is um, making sure that we do not have uh, to make sure that we don't have any injection. So that means I still want to end up with pointing two things to the same place. So that means you know, how you remove existing arrows and how you add additional arrows becomes important. Now there are many solutions, okay? You know, what I use here is just one of the solutions. But the, my, but the concept is you have to meet all the criteria as specified here. And then number four is trying to make sure that you know, every element in D, um, let me see, there's one thing in D that is not mapped to. So that means you know, R is, you know, R as it is in F0, you know, satisfies that requirement. So as long as I don't map anything, new thing to R, I'm good to go. Yep. How do you define F1? Hmm? How did you define Oh, F1 is derived, so once you find E0 and E1, F1 is just defined as this, which is you take out E0 and add E1 to F0, oh. that becomes F1. So they take out all the way up to Adam. Yep, yep. 
that's just you know, how F1 is defined. The real question is uh, what E0 and what E1 should be should be used in this case. Mm -hmm. So are we doing okay so far? All right. <clears throat> I'm going to move on and talk about the next one, which is question number two. All right, so the format of the question is very similar, but some of the true and false are flipped. Okay, so you just have to be careful with that. So do you want me to just use one screen? We'll just use one screen, okay? So I'm going to sit down here. <clears throat> I'm not used to sitting down and talking at the same time. You know, it's just weird for me. All right, so it's kind of the same question here, okay, part two. The part one is asking, do we have a function? If you look at this one, do we have a function? So let's check. B maps to, oh, okay, B is mentioned twice, done, it's not a function. Okay, does everybody understand what I just said? I look at the definition of F0, I see B maps to Q, B maps to B, I instantly knows that f0 cannot be a function. And in this case, you know, the question did not ask you to explain why, so you can just say no. So I'm just going to use, I'm going to use both phrase, you know, for the answer. Um, okay, the answer is no. And then for the next part, what is the value of, okay, you know, so this entire quantified expression is either true or false, okay? So we'll first answer whether it's true or false. If it is false, then we also have a second part to answer. So this one is asking um, for everything in X, okay, there is at least one thing in B that X maps to um, according to F0. Well, we know the answer is going to be false already. Because there are five things in A, <laughs> we know D uses two of those entries. So that means one of the thing in A cannot be mapping to something in B. Okay, so that's this is using the pigeonhole principle to kind of answer that question. But you know, I'm not asking about you know how you find that. I just need you to tell me whether the answer is true or false, and if it is false, why is it false? So we say it is false. And what value of x is going to make the universally quantified expression false? So we just have to say, okay, does b map to at least one thing in, uh, does element b map to one thing, at least one thing in set b? The answer is yes, we're good. Um, does a map to at least one thing in b? Yes. m is good. b, okay, we got it already. j is all good. So D is the element in A that did not map to anything in B according to F0. So that means you know, um, X is D in order to make this universally quantified expression false. So this part is the same, okay? You know, if you think about you know, what we did in the first question, this is exactly the same applied to a different definition of F0. Part three, okay? Um, basically asking about the same thing. Is one thing in A mapped to two different things in B? The answer is yes. And we know who that is, right? You know, because I just mentioned it earlier. <clears throat> so in this case, we know that um, B is mapping to two different things. Uh, one thing that it mapped to is Q. The other thing that it mapped to is B. Yep, there we go. So once again, if you flip the order of the Q and the B, it's fine, okay? You know, because ordering is not important in this case. Okay, moving on to part four. So part four is asking really the same thing. Define a new set F1 by removing one element from F0 and adding a new element into F0 such that blah, blah, blah is true. Okay, so we'll take a look at the blah, blah, blah here. The first one is similar to this expression here, but we want it to be false, okay? This one says, you know, if it is true, specify who is mapped to two different things. 
This one says, I don't want anyone to map to two different things. So the question now is, what do I need to remove in order uh, for, in order not to have something in A to map to two different things in B? Um, I can take out BQ, I can also take out BB, okay? So I don't know exactly which one I want to take out, so right now I'm just going to say, well, it can be either one. So I can say, you know, either BQ, BQ, or BB. So I'm going to make a note here, you know, basically saying that it can be either one. I cannot decide which one yet, okay? Now go to going to part two. We are saying, okay, let's add one thing. Let's add one two tuple to F0 so that every element maps to at least one thing in B. So we look at the original one and go like, yeah, we know D did not map to anything. So that means you know, in order to make um, this statement true, in order to make this statement true, we need to make sure that D also maps to one thing in at least one thing in B. So that means I got a few choices here. Um, it means that we can choose, oh, this is not the right one. Um, this is the right one, there we go. So we can say that D can map to something in B, okay? I'm just gonna use that notation to mean that I'm not really sure which one yet, okay? The asterisk is used as a wildcard symbol in a lot of languages, including DOS or CMD in Windows. So it simply means, you know, we don't know what it is yet, okay? You know, we'll, we'll determine that later. Uh, number three says, okay, so this part is important, okay? Because this expression has to do with, what again? You know, we analyzed the same thing earlier. For every B, for every two elements in F1, uh, we want you know, basically these two. Either they either we have the same element, you know, uh, as B and X, or if they're different, we want them to map to diff two different things. Once again, we want it to be false. So in terms of injection versus surjection or the negation thereof, what are we trying to specify? We want it not to be an injection, okay? We don't want an injection, okay? So using that as a criteria and looking at the solution that we already have compared to the original set here, so tell me what you can do to make this not an injection. There are a lot of choices. <laughs> a lot of choices here. So, okay, we'll keep that in mind first, okay? So I'm just gonna write down a clue here so the, I can remind myself what we need to do. So this is number three, we just second to the last one. Okay, so I'm just gonna say here, okay, not injective. In other words, I'm reminding myself that I want to end up with a not an injection, but I'm not really sure how to do it yet because I have to look at the last one. So when we look at the last one, this one says you know, there exists an element in B such that it is not the case that something in A is mapping to it. Okay, so what is this trying to say? Okay, first of all, does it have to do with injection or surjection? It has to do with surjection. So do we, do we want surjection or do we not want surjection? We want surjection. Okay, so we want it to be surjective. All right, so let's, find, let's explain why this is specifying that we want surjection. Because what this is saying is um, there is at least one thing in B, okay, such that it is not the case that at least one thing in the domain is mapping to it. So if it is not the case that at least one thing is mapping to it, that means nothing is mapping to it, okay? In other words, this is saying I want something in the codomain that is not mapped to, okay? But I want it to be false. So it is double negation, which means I do want 
every element in the codomain to be mapped to, which means I want surjection. It is triple, well, it's double, it's double negation from the perspective of what is shown here, but it's actually triple negation. Tri triple negation when, it, when, when you are looking at your not surjective, because we want not surjective to be false, which means we want it to be surjective. <laughs> Yep. Okay. So now we know we want not injective, but we want surjective. Okay. And we are starting with something like this. We take out one thing, we add one more thing. Okay. So the surjection part is the tricky part because we want your Q, C, B, D all to be mapped to. So let's take a look at you know, how many of those are already mapped to. D is mapped to. B is mapped to sort of. Okay. So we can afford to take out the BQ in order to maintain everything being mapped to. So BQ is the is is a good one to take out. Okay. So that means you know, when we have this question here, we can take out one or the other. Now we know BQ is the one that we want to take out. So if you look at it's hard, it's not just hard for you to read, it's hard for me to read too, because I'm trying to read all this stuff here and find out where my answers are located. So I think it's over here. There we go. So we are going to take out your BQ. So that means your BB, we do not want to take out BB. There we go. So BQ, we want to take out. Now the question is, what do we want D to map to? Mm, it doesn't really matter. Because you know, it doesn't matter what D is mapped to. A is mapping to C already, M is mapping to Q already, B is mapping to D already, J is mapping to D already. We already have something that is surjective. Doesn't matter what you know, we are adding. So that means you know, here, here we have a, we can literally choose any one. Okay, so we can just say, uh, let's map it to C again. That's a solution. It's not the only solution, but it will work. Is that okay? So once we have determined that we want to remove BQ and we want to add BC, then we can we know what C is. Okay, well, excuse me, we know what F1 is. So now we can now say uh, F1. Oops. F1 is what we have before. We have AC, M, Q, B, B. J, D, and you know we decided to add D, C to it. So the, so now we want to double check and make sure that this F one is indeed a function. It is not an injection, but it's a surjection. Okay, so we want to double check. Okay, let's double check. Is everything in A mapped to at least one thing in D? Okay, we start with D. Yep, D is good. J is good, M is good, um, oh, I forgot B. So B is good too, and so is A. Okay, so everything from A maps to one and only one thing in B. So we're good. Is it not an injection? We want this not to be an injection. It is not an injection because A and D, they both map to C. So it's not an injection. Is it a surjection? Okay, let's double check. Is Q mapped to? Yep, M is mapping, mapping to Q. Is C mapped to? Yep, two things mapped to C, so we're good there. Is B mapped to? Yep, B maps to B. Is D mapped to? Yep, J maps to D. So that means it satisfies all the requirements. And now we get to this portion here, okay? You know, the, the common elements between um, F1 and F0 is um, AC, MQ, BB, and JD. So those four, these four are in the intersection. Is that okay? I'm not writing it down, just you know, highlighting it because you know, I think it's, it's okay not to write down the entire solution. And then number six is something that we just answered earlier. Um, this F1 is not injective, so it should be false here or no. And it is a surjection, so this should be true or yes.
Are we good so far? Okay, so I think we can actually pick up the pace a little bit here. So number three, um, is it true that a f0 is a function mapping from a to b? All right, so let's see how we screwed up this time. k is mapped to two different things, and m does not map to anything. Okay, so clearly this is not a function. So you just say no, it is not true. So number two, what is the value of this? Okay, the answer, if the answer is false, blah, blah, blah. So once again, this is asking, is everything in X in A, is, does everything in A map to at least one thing in B? The answer is no, because um, who's missing? M is missing. So for this particular question, X equals to M is going to cause this underlying portion to be false. And then number three is asking, um, is one thing in A mapping to two different things in B? Okay, because it's the same, it's the same expression. So we know that K is mapped to two different things. So that means X equals to K, Y equals to R, and Z equals to J in this case. And then for number four, you know, we, the, the tricky part about number four is about three and four. Okay, because if those two can be you know, true or false depending on what I want you to do. So in this case, we want this to be true, which means we want injection. And we want this also to be true, which means we don't want a surjection. So we want an injection, but not a surjection. So now you have to ask, is it even possible? Well, it is possible. In fact, it has to be the case. Okay, there's no way we can have a surjection in this case. Why? I just made a statement without working it out. Yes? The cardinality of B is greater than A? Yes. Because there are more things in the codomain than there are things in the domain, then obviously something is not going to be mapped to in the codomain. Okay. So now we have to ask, what kind of surgery do we need to do to turn this into a injection, but not a surjection? Well, first of all, you know, you have to take out one of these two. It doesn't really matter which one we, you take out because the one thing that we're going to add to it can compensate to make sure that it is still, it remains as an injection. So let's say we take out KJ, okay? This is what we take out. But we also have to add one more two tuple because M is not mapping to anything. So that means the micro surgery that we really need to do is to turn this K into M. Is that okay? Once we are done with that, then you know, f of one is going to be an injection, but not a surjection. The intersection between f and zero and f one is going to consist of CQ, KR, QA as the element. This is the only one that is taken out and get re got replaced. All right, are we good? So you can kind of see, once you understand what the question is asking, it's like boom, 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 you can move it out. <clears throat> so question number four, same format, okay? The only difference is between the three and the four of part four. So once again, it is not a function, okay? No here. Um, the answer is false because we have something that is not mapping to something in, something in A does not map to at least one thing in B. In this case, it is K. Okay, you guys are fast. So K is the answer to number two. And does one thing map to two different things in B? Yes. So J, you know, J from A maps to both R and C in the codomain, or I shouldn't say codomain, but B. All right, so now this time we want it to be an injection and also a surjection, okay? So now the question is, how do we perform that microsurgery so that we end up with an injection and a surjection, which is a bijection? All right, so we know that we have to take out one of these two and add something back. So we got a few options here. So the microsurgery is to take out JR and then reintroduce, which one is missing again? KR. Okay, so we take out JR and then we put back KR. And then the intersection is AQ, DJ, JC. That would be the intersection. And then to answer this last part here, yes, it is going to be an injection, and yes, it's going to be a surjection. All right.
right, so question number five. You might actually be able to answer all the questions today. So question number five is saying that the G function in the L of no module is a function that maps, you know, basically the Cartesian product of natural number and natural number to just the natural numbers. We find a function f so that it maps from z or integers to natural numbers that is bijective so that you can but combine the use of g and f to make function h. So what do we want function h to do? It is mapping the Cartesian product of integers and integers to the set of natural numbers. Okay, And I'm already telling you what uh, where h of x, y is the g of f of x comma the f of y because f is converting from integer to natural number and the g is combining the it's folding a two-dimensional space into a single dimensional space define your function f in the following space okay so if you have read the notes already this is kind of like can we can, can i copy and paste can i just cut out certain portions of the print out of my notes and tape it into the answer right If, you're, if, you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you might need to review the material. <laughs> because we have already talked about such a function when in the L of no module. So, L of no is, relation is not in it. Did I say L of no is not going to be on it? Okay, all right, fine. Yeah, then it's fine. Just, just, yeah, just that's double okay. checking because I remember you said that last week. So. Nope, that's fine. You know, sometimes I forget what I've said, okay. and that's why I have recording. I mean, I'm not opposed about you. Nope, nope. The that's okay. Right? Yep, so L of no is not here. It's going to be an exam too then. Okay. Yeah. That's what yep. Okay, so we are done because your know, question number five does not apply to us in this semester. Can you still answer? Huh? Oh, do, do I still want to answer it? Yeah. Okay, sure. So f of x, okay, you know, because f is mapping from integer to natural number, so that means uh, we use the ternary expression. Um, if x is less than zero, if it's negative, I mean, I think in the notes I do the opposite way. If it's greater than or equal to zero, then we just say, okay, let's multiply it by two. Otherwise, if it is negative, then we want to uh, we want to do something like this. So I think that that was the function in the module itself. Okay. In the following space, show how you compute the value of w equals to h of negative six, negative five. That's just you know, applying all the functions. Okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead and work on this. <clears throat> all right, so we want to compute h of negative 6, negative 5, which is, which is the g of f of negative 6, comma, oh, wait, double, double parent here. So f of negative 6, comma, f of negative 5. Doo -doo. Um, am I missing one pair? I am. There we go. And then that becomes uh, G of, uh, what is it? Negative 6 maps to 13 because it's negative 2 times negative 6, which is 12, and the subtract one is 11. This is 11, that makes the other one 9, right? And then we then apply the g function, and that is a fraction, something, something, plus the y value, which is a 9. The fraction is going to take um, 11 plus 9, and then 11 plus 9 plus 1, and then we divide the whole thing by two. So now the whole thing becomes uh, 
20 times 21 divided by 2, which is 10 times 21 plus 9. Okay, let me think again. 10 times 21 is 210, so plus 9 is 219. All right, so moving on. Yeah, I think this question is, this for, for the all of no question, you know, this one is, is really one of the easiest questions because it, it's just follow the definitions, apply the definitions, and you get the value. So in this case, we want, because both G and F are bijective, we know that H is bijective because H is the compound function making out, you know, only making use of bijections. Um, no need to prove that as a part of your answer. Okay, so that's good. In the following space, Huh? Oh, okay. In the following space, we'll show how you utilize G inverse and F inverse to define H inverse so that HY, excuse me, XY as a two tuple equals to the inverse function of H of V, where XY are integers and V is a natural number. So, <coughs> In this case, I don't, I'm not asking you to give me the exact definition. I'm asking you to use, utilize the inverse function of G and F in order to express the answer. Okay, so how do we do this? <laughs> You're starting with a natural number. And so the way we apply the inverse function is reverse compared to the way we apply the original function. So we can see how the H function applies to G last, okay? So that means when we are looking at the inverse function, it is the first thing that we need to do, okay? Because it's kind of like a stack structure, last in, first out, okay? So now we look at this answer and we have to apply uh, G inverse first, so there we go. So the problem is G inverse is it, it would give us two values. So now I have to say, okay, um, we find out you know, the XY from applying G inverse. And that is applied to V, which is the value that we are given with. Am I using the wrong portion? Nope, I'm using the right portion. Nope, the wrong portion. Uh, okay. So move this here and then move this over here. There we go. Okay, I was using the wrong portion. All right, so the first thing is to apply G inverse. And then once we have X and Y, then we apply um, F inverse. So, okay, I, I cannot use X, Y because it's part of the answer. So I'm gonna change this to U and V. And then we know that X is going to be F inverse applied to x, and then y is f inverse applied to v. And since v is also used, I cannot use that. <laughs> Make it a w. Um, right, there we go. The inverse of x, mm -hmm. inverse of f, we put x, that should be you, yeah, this one should be you, but it's complaining about I'm missing, oh, but that's because I closed this incorrectly, but then, syntax error, there we go. So that would be the solution, okay, you know, because you have to apply the inverse in the reverse order compared to the original function. All right, cool, yep. Um, so what are we given with? We're given with V, right? So that so that's this V is referring to this V here. So after that we end up with two temporary variables. Basically U and W are temporary. So that we apply F inverse to U to get X and we apply F inverse to W to get Y. All right. So step by step empirically verify this. Okay, that's gonna take a little bit of time because you have to actually apply the G inverse, which is the the problematic one. 
So I'm not going to do that because we are running out of time. All right. So we still have, let's see, today is Wednesday. So we have next Monday before the exam. The exam one is on next Wednesday. So what are you guys going to do? Panic. Some people pray. Cry. Cry. Just interleaving between, between crying and praying. Okay? No. Well, okay. I'm not saying that you should not do any one of those two things, but I'm suggesting a third thing that you might consider doing, which is studying. <laughs> but how do you study? Okay? Because it means different things to different people. Some people think of studying as, you know, I'm just going to read every module again. Yeah, scan it. Or I, I re-watch you know, the, the video recorded of this class. Those may be helpful, but it is when you encounter something that is challenging, like, you know, I'm not really sure what this means, don't go any further, okay? You know, whenever you see something you're not quite getting, you're not quite understanding, stop put a bookmark over there, okay, some kind of sticky, okay, and then you try to figure that out first. Okay, having a study buddy sometimes helps, okay, it depends on your personality, and also depends on a lot of other, a lot of other factors, but whatever you do, okay, try to study as much as possible, and, you know, use this as a, you know, as a help, okay, I guess, you know, to help you study, but don't overstudy, okay? You know, this is basically defining the scope of what is in the test, but it is not necessarily the same format as your test. So you have to remain flexible to go like, okay, I know it's gonna involve, guess what, set concepts, okay? Intersection, union, difference, member of, okay? It's gonna involve functions, what makes a function a function, what is injection, what is surjection, what is bijection, okay? And then you also have to practice a lot of quantified expressions, okay? So all the quantified expression that is here, you have to make sure that, okay, I get it, okay? I understand exactly what this means. I know how to evaluate the quantified expression. So if I have to prioritize, okay, I'm gonna prioritize quantified expressions first, okay? That is the most important thing. Because the set concepts are fairly simple once you understand the quantifiers. Um, the function concepts, mm, kind of easy once you understand the quantified expressions. So I would still say quantified expressions is the most important part. Now, if you want to go for the graphical way, you know, to kind of visualize your quantified expression, go ahead and do it. But I would just use a loop concept to go through the quantified expressions. Just make sure you understand how to translate the universal quantifier to a loop and translate the existential quantifier to a loop. All right, I still have office hours, okay? So far, only one student out of my three classes have used like 30 minutes of one of my office hours. So make use of my office hours. I promise I do not bite. All right, I'll see you guys, you know, next Monday, if not any time earlier. <clears throat> if I don't see you guys, have a nice weekend doing all those three things, crying, praying, and studying. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> <clears throat> yep, you too. <laughs>